everybody. Welcome to episode 60 of Truth, Lies, and Puffy Mills. I'm Nicole Galvan. I'm here with Mindy Callison and Ashley Dale, and our special guest today is Mark Peters. He is the Illinois State Director for Humane Society of the United States. So welcome, Mark. Um, if, you, if he looks familiar, it's because he's been here before. Um, Mark has done a lot of work alongside a, a whole bunch of really active and really great advocates in Illinois. And so we're going to talk about all things Illinois today because there's so much going on on the puppy mill front. So welcome, Mark. And um, I guess we'll just get right into it. What's going on in Illinois? <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate coming back on the air with you folks and talking about all the fun stuff that we're doing in Illinois. Um, yeah, just as a, as a recap, I think a lot of your listeners know that, thank God, Illinois, we finally became the fifth state in the entire country to ban the retail sale of dogs, cats, Yay. and pet stores. Finally, it only took seven years, guys. I mean, it wasn't that long of a wait, uh, seven years, but we finally achieved it. And we're, we're still kind of celebrating that monumental victory. And thanks again to uh, bailing out Benji, too. You guys were a big help. And, and getting that across the finish line with all your records and, and all your help um, getting activists involved and sending action alerts and all the like. So thank you so much for, for helping us. And so we thought after last year, you know, in 2021, passing that major initiative that we would be done discussing at least that topic uh, in Illinois. But no, the pet store industry being primarily pet land and another smaller chain called Furry Babies has decided they want to come back again and hire the same lobbyist again, and in fact, hire even more than they had last year to try and repeal the new law that we just passed. And so that's exactly what they did. They came back with, I think they've got around a half dozen lobbyists, maybe more than that at this point, that they brought back to repeal the new humane pet store law. And I think it's important to keep in mind that last year, that law passed with super majorities in each chamber. It was 76 votes in the House, super majority of people in that chamber, Republicans and Democrats. When it same thing happened, it was 37 votes, which is way more than a super majority. And so this, and so this was a widely popular law that was passed we kind of expected that supermajority to, to deal kind of a blow to the ambitions of the pet store industry to come back again and try to repeal it, but they just can't accept the fact that they lost. Um, and so um, some weird things happened, you know, right around the fall of last year. You know, remember that when we passed the law, the governor signed it, I think, sometime in the summer, around the end of August. And we had given the pet stores 180 days to this humane model or face penalties. And so 180 calendar days out from that summer is February 23rd of this year. And so the law that we have in Illinois still has not even taken effect yet. And so what happened was even last fall, when we came back for the, um, what we call the fall veto session, it's only about two weeks long, Normally, it's veto cleanup and technical cleanup. Um, the pastoral industry came back with those six lobbyists in the fall to repeal the law that the governor just signed back in August. And that effort went nowhere. Um, they found a representative to basically hijack a bill that came over from the state. They hijacked it. They filed what's called a gut and replace amendment so it was Senate Bill 1751, House Amendment 2, that came over into the House. They hijacked it with this amendment, and it would have repealed all the things that we just passed earlier in the year. And so luckily, that amendment did not get heard over in the fall because we had just passed a law. There was no appetite to hear this again. And we had pulled off enough support, um, Democrats and Republicans, that it was not even going to be considered for a vote in the fall. And so we thought maybe that was the last effort. We're done next year, you know, we'll be in the clear. No, no, they're, they're trying again. They brought everyone back. 
um, half dozen lobbyists. They filed a brand new bill just last week, um, and it's House Bill 4643. Um, and it, it's the same thing as they filed before. It literally repeals, guts, weakens the humane pet store law that we just passed in Illinois. And the Senate amendment was so confusing because the bill that they took over, wasn't it like title insurance or something? And then they just snuck in something about the pet stores? Yeah, yeah, there was, it was pretty sneaky. And I think what happened was, you know, in the, in the, during the fall, there was no time anymore to introduce new legislation. That, that time had already passed. And so the only option for the pet stores was to basically hijack a bill that maybe it wasn't moving or it was no, no longer needed in the legislature. And that's pretty common. But, but this was an income tax bill. This had nothing to do with, with animal welfare. And there were a lot of animal bills that didn't move last year too, that they could have taken and maybe you know, did an amendment with that. But they, they took a bill that was literally, yeah, about income taxes, and it passed in the Senate. And when it came over into the House, I guess it was no longer needed or it didn't move or something. And so the representative, uh, the sponsor, took over the bill and filed what's called a gut and replace amendment. And if adopted, the amendment would become the bill. And so it would become the new pet store repeal. But when we tried getting advocates involved last fall and earlier this year, you know, they're pretty savvy, our advocates are, and they looked at the bill and said, no, this is income tax bill. You've got the wrong bill. And we said, no, it's 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 the right one, It's but it's House Amendment 2. Here's a link. You can read it. But but you're right, Ashley. It was a very sneaky attempt in, uh, in what they tried last year. They've done that here in Arizona before. Actually, that's how we got our crappy pet store law here that uh, repealed all of our uh, city ordinances, um, and they did that on a, we call it a striker amendment over here, um, where, yeah, they, they got a bill that had nothing to do with anything about pets or at all. I think it was like a, a water, a bill about like water rights or something, and they struck the, all the language out and then put in this horrible bill that took away cities' rights to regulate pet sales, and then they, they um, stuck it snuck it through after the deadline to introduce bills so yeah we it just kind of goes to show like we're always having to be on the lookout for what's next and what's next and what's next it's like the battle never ends (laughs) and so far in illinois this language doesn't have preemption right it's just basically repealing the main bill that was passed last year yeah yeah that's it so far and we're we're keeping our eyes out for preemption of course but you know this one just is kind of just status quo the 22 i think ordinances that we have right now on the books would would still stand um you know so that that's good but it it would still you know allow the pet stores that are there right now operating to still continue to sell those puppy mill puppies in their pet stores I, I, before this episode, I put on my shirt, the, the shirt I chose today is the bailing out Benji shirt that says until every cage is empty. And I felt like that was like the most encompassing of what's, what has been happening in Illinois this whole time. You guys have been fighting this in a million different ways at every angle and just kind of continuing to juggle all the pieces and, and, and continue the fight. It's been quite the journey. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, you know, I guess it was a little naive of, of at least me to think that, you know, we would be done with this. You know, I guess I just thought, you know, we took the wind out of their sails and they're going to go and look at some other state or they'll just, you know, they'll find somewhere else to move to. But, I, you know, they're, there's, they can't do that. They can't accept the fact that they lost this war because they have so much money being generated from Illinois alone and they can't just sit quietly and, and let it pass. And with eight pet lane locations and all the other independent Ma and Pa locations, the other two chains, Furry Babies and Happiness as Pets, it's just too much of a buyer state um, to just sit by it and, and let it happen. And so I guess they thought, well, let's, let's try it again. We have enough money on the side to pull together and try a, a repeal. And they bring back the same people time and time again, the same lobbyist that's lost 20 some times in a row on local ordinances. He's tried numerous preemption attempts at the state level 
we beat them every time and yet they keep bringing the same people back and it it, it blows my mind that you can continue wasting millions of dollars on this effort and and not to mention the fact that they could spend probably a fraction of that to just convert to the humane model i mean you think about the millions of dollars that's been spent in the last seven years that dwarfs in comparison what it would have taken to just convert these stores outright to the model that we passed last year um, but they they just don't want to do it they just can't well so you know this but annually the state of Illinois imports between 10 and 12,000 puppies and kittens for resale in pet stores alone. So this is like, I mean, if you just look at loose numbers, um, like a range of numbers, if every puppy is being sold for $5,000, this could be a $60 million industry just in the pet stores. And of course, we know the prices fluctuate, but that's why Illinois is a battleground state. I mean, Petland alone is making millions of dollars by buying a puppy for two or three hundred dollars and then hiking the price up to five thousand, six thousand, twelve thousand dollars. So it's it's lucrative. And I'm not surprised that they're fighting it, but you're right. They're wasting so much money when they could have just converted. They could easily convert all of their stores and just have supplies. Yeah, yeah, they could they could do that, and I guess you know they're they're going to make another effort at least and say we're going to give it a shot and and see where this goes. You know, it, it's almost it's so repetitive. You know, the redundancy of this effort. Well, in the legislature, I mean, the legislature in Illinois wants to move on to other things. They are tired of talking about puppies. You know, and I and I don't blame them. I mean, we've we've been there for seven years just rehashing this effort over and over and over again. And and I think we all thought it's it's done, you know, it's now law and and now we can maybe discuss, you know, maybe some cleanup or uh, other other animal related efforts, but you know, they want to try it again and and good luck. You know, they're, they're it's going to have the same fate as it's had before, but um, you know, I feel pretty confident this is not going to move whatsoever. I mean, have spoken loud and clear. They don't want these stores around. They've, they've said that over and over again. That was evident with all the humane ordinances that we had passed over the years. I mean, it was a snowball effect. More passing, just building up momentum for this big statewide effort. And then when you saw the statewide effort clear with supermajority, I mean, even the legislature agreed, we're ready. This is time. We're ready for this. Let's, let's let's get this across the finish line and and move on, and to think that they're going to spend another million dollars, whatever they're spending on this repeal effort, they're just wasting their time. And I just looked uh, last night, more thousands of dollars into local races, campaign races, to I guess sway people again that this is the right thing to do. Um, I wish them good luck, but it ain't going to happen. We're going to stop it. It's not going to pass. It's not going to pass the House. It's not certainly going to pass in the Senate. And and I would even argue that even if it got to the governor's desk, he would probably veto it um, because this is just ridiculous. It's just a, um, a slimy effort on behalf of the pet store industry at this point. Right. And we've talked about this before. Like the power of our side is that we have thousands of citizens who are contacting policymakers. The other side, it's like Petland and their lobbyists and sometimes breeders from across the country. It's never a huge localized effort that they have. And when they have people testify, often it's people who are paid, it's their employees who are coming. And we just have so much more manpower because the everyday Illinois citizen wants to see this type of bill passed. It's absolutely it. Yeah. And I think you look at the um, so there was a hearing that was going to be set on the old vehicle that he was using. That was the, the Senate Bill 1751 Amendment 2. That was going to be in committee last week for a hearing. Look at the witness lips. And just as a reminder, the witness lips, you know, are a way to view who supports and opposes a bill. And the witness lips were just so amusing to look at. We had, I think, almost 3,000 witness lips in opposition to this amendment. And we got that in a matter of days. I mean, we didn't even have to try. 
to, to get that. And they were nowhere near the bill because they were gonna you know, file this brand new one and try to be sneaky. But even when this new bill, the HB 4643 is posted for a hearing, you look at the witness slips and you see, who do they have on their side? I mean, 80% of those names, yeah, you're right, Mindy, it's employees and it's their lobbyists. It's, it's not the general public. It's not your average Joe, the neighbor that wants to see animals treated better. It's anyone that's literally getting paid by this industry to file a witness slip. And they might get 100, 200. I mean, they might even get 300 if they really tried. They're not going to get anywhere near 1,000 like we do on any given time on this type of legislation. The, the, the public is so behind what we're doing. They just don't want to accept that. Yeah, and you guys have quite the coalition out there. Like, I've never seen a group of people work together so well and and just kind of get done what needs to get done at the, you know, at the very last second, whenever they, people need to step up, they're right there. And it's it's pretty incredible what, what you've built there um, with all the other advocates. Yeah, you know, I think seven years of kind of doing all these local ordinances and things, we've kind of built up a really nice machine of, of local advocates who, you know, uh, always stayed with us and said, you know, whatever you need, you know, if it's fighting preemption or, you know, getting support for this or that, they're still there and they're not giving up this fight. And when they found out that, you know, these vehicles were moving in the legislature to repeal the law that we just passed, you know, they're like, how do I get involved? I mean, it, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. It was already there. And so we put out the word and, and they get to work. They pick up the phone. And that's a cool thing about animal activists is they they know how to do this stuff now. I mean, they are experts and and knowing who their lawmakers are. They know who their house rep is, who their state senator is. They know how to tell other people that and how to find them and how to get in contact with them. They're savvy on social media. I mean, it, it's really remarkable to, to at least get the word out and you watch it unfold. And, and you can see lawmakers getting phone calls across the state and, and it, they even post on social media. I had a, a house rep um, put out a tweet saying that she was not gonna be supporting this um, Senate Bill 1751 and because she had an A rating with the Humane Society Legislative Fund, which is our, our kind of our political arm. Um, but it, it's just so cool. And I didn't even ask her that. She just did it on her own. And, and, and you're right, it's the advocates, they're the ones driving this effort. It's, it's remarkable to sit back and watch. Yeah. And the best part about that little coalition is everyone works together. Like, so if my, if our bailing out Benji's action, a link is ready before anyone else's, that's the one getting shared. If best friends, animal society has their action alert up, like no one cares whose name is on it. And everyone is just working. So the goal, the end goal, it's, it's no one's victory. It's everyone's victory, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's not really the same in every other state. A lot of states, advocates are like, this is mine. This is the thing I'm doing. And people aren't as easy to work with. Yeah. I mean, we even saw a lot of the, um, you know, the kind of like the rabbit coalitions. I mean, I know they've been guests on, on this program before, too. And, we you know, we, we didn't able, we weren't able to get the rabbits, you know, put into our Illinois um, but, you know, they were very happy with the law passing, too, because, you know, if these pet stores aren't going to be around peddling dogs and cats, they're not going to be around peddling rabbits either. And, but now that, you know, there's this attempt to repeal the law, you know, even the rabbit coalitions like Red Door and all these other groups have been helping us, you know, to stop these stores from doing this. And it's just everyone is helping out that, that can help out. And, I mean, that's why I feel so confident that, you know, this is not going to get through. I mean, it, it might eke out of a committee. It, that, that might be possible. Um, because, you know, what these guys are, are doing is they are cashing in every, every chip they, that they've got, every favor that they've got. I mean, they're, they're calling it in. And they are trying to get this bill to a different committee. Because if they can get it to a different committee for a hearing, it, it could possibly get out. Uh, you know, and the committee that we have assigned to this issue called the Consumer Protection Committee, I mean, I feel pretty darn confident that it, it, it won't move out of that committee. But I'm hearing that they are pressing this bill to get to a different committee. And so there's, there's the dreaded Ag and Conservation Committee. 
There is the executive committee where this house sponsor is the vice chair of. If it goes there, it could likely just because of his power alone, or it could go to another committee that he's been trying to steer it to. But you know, getting it on the floor and getting 60, 70 votes to, to pass. I mean, that's going to be a real challenge. And another really interesting point here is that this is an election year. Um, you know, a lot of states are going to have elections this, this spring and this summer, midterms. And this is not going to be a very important issue to be voting on and to put yourself in danger of, of voting for puppy mills. I mean, who's going, to, who's, who's going to do that? Who's going to risk their political career on a bill like this? And so I kind of think that's that's kind of in favor as well. It's like I can't even believe that a bill, a legislator is sponsoring this bill after the overwhelming support that it had across the board. It's just wild. Yeah, I mean, there were, you know, there was probably a few dozen no votes between all the, you know, the Senate and House, you know, combined. And, you know, they, they found as no votes were and went and said, hey, do you want to, we saw that you don't you don't like the law that passed. Do you want to try for a repeal? And they said, sure, let's go for it. And the representative that is pushing the bill in Illinois doesn't even have a pet store in his district. None. I mean, none that sell puppies anyway. And and so why he's doing this, I have no reason. I've, I've met with him before. I've met with the lobbyists, of course, who are pushing this. And you know they're all over the map with why they want to do this. It's about jobs, or it's about uh, not regulating local business, or they make up some reason. Um, it's just not going to be a very popular thing to bring up this year because I think the legislature is exhausted from hearing about this issue over and over again. And when when we make it known, which we all are, that this is a vote in favor of puppy mills. That's not going to be very, a very popular topic to bring home to your, you know, your your constituents when you want to, you know, run a local office or a statewide office. Um, so it's 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 not going to work out well for those that want to hit the green button on this bill for this year. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today was the like astroturf, the fake group that was created. The what is it? Protect our pets, Illinois. Um, this is something we see across the country. Petland has their own lobbying fake group in florida too i don't even i think it's like florida pet protections but they create these groups and it causes so much confusion so in illinois it's protect our pets illinois and you might see sponsored posts on facebook or posts in community groups from this page and it looks like it would be from us or from you but it's not it's literally pet land furry babies the pet industry creating this little front group to make it look like they care about animals. And then it also confuses legislators as well as the local public. Because they always sound like names that, that imply that they care about animals, right? Like, and I, there's been so many in Illinois, the last seven years we've seen, the first one was the Illinois Pet Lovers Association. I mean, who could argue with that? They love pets. Um, so, hey, who can argue against that? That was, kind of a conglomerate of all the of the folks in Illinois, you know, pulling their money into this association to hire lobbyists, then that really wasn't working. I think that website's even down now. When I looked at it a few weeks ago, it wasn't even up. And then there was the Humane Illinois Puppy Alliance. And that was started, remember back when we were debating the Aurora Pet Store Ordinance. And then that one, that one's just completely gone. I think that Facebook page is still up, but it's more or less defunct. And, and now, yeah, there, it's Protect Our Pets, Illinois, um, which is primarily fairy babies um, driving that one, the messaging, um, but also Patline is probably funding it in some shape, way, or form. But yeah, they, they all have these really nice, fancy websites that they pop up overnight and, and they create little action alerts and, and, and they're very deceiving in how they get out there messaging with, with sponsored ads and you know, a cute little logo with a puppy on it and say, we don't like puppy mills either. And like, you know, and they try to confuse lawmakers that way. And unfortunately, it, it does work. I mean, some lawmakers are, I think, are very confused by that. Um, uh, but hopefully not enough to, you know, sway this bill in, in their favor. 
but we're always having to fight these these fake phony groups that just come up with a new name to try and pass some attempt to continue peddling puppies and pet stores. It's just, it, it never seems to stop. Well, I haven't seen it on, and correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen this on the Protect Our Pets Illinois page, but on the Florida Pet Protections Petland page, they now have an action alert that you can just put your address in and hit send. And so policymakers in Florida are hearing from people who think the bill they're supporting is the bill we would support. And it's just, it's crazy to me that they can be so deceptive and even try to create their own action alerts now to make the public think they're supporting a good bill. And it's just not good. No, it's not good. And I, I think they are doing some action alerts. I think I've seen, you know, a few things on their on their Facebook feed. When you click on it, it takes you to some pre-filled email that's already wrote out for you. You just type in your name and address and click send and it. And it just says like, hey, dear representative, you know, the law that passed last year isn't good and it doesn't stop puppy mills, but this one will, you know, so please support H, you know, and, and it's, it's a, it's a template email that's not very convincing, but I think when they read the name, the, oh, protect our pets, what, what is this about? I've had though zero lawmakers contact me and say, who is this? Because I, I think they, they already know. I, I think... You know, we've done a pretty good job of dispelling the myths, you know, being put out by these sham organizations time after time that, that people know that this is not a, a reputable group. They know the people at, at the state capitol who are pushing animal welfare legislation, and it is not contract lobbyists. It's organizations like ours are the ones pushing, you know, bills and laws like this. Um, but I, I just think it's it's just... It's just so frustrating. And when people actually read these bills, which they do, I mean, even our, our advocates read these bills and they read these amendments, they're just shocked at how they can get away with it. You know, and, and a good example is that when you read Senate Bill 1751, amendment number, the very first three lines that you see, it's on page two, the first three lines, is it says, an animal shelter and animal control shall not conduct a background check of an adoptee prior to the adoption of a dog or a cat. They're, they're, they were literally saying, you can't do a background check on someone to make sure that you're adopting a dog or cat to someone that doesn't have convictions for animal cruelty or dog fighting or neglect or anything like that. They're, so they were literally letting someone adopt a dog to a convicted abuser. Like, why? I mean, if this is a pet store bill, why are you regulating what shelters and rescues do? I mean, and, and the background check, that is just common sense. And so when, when animal control folks read that, they went crazy. I mean, they're like, we do this all the time. Shelters do this all the time. Rescues do this all the time. They run, you know, soft background checks on someone just to make sure that they're not adopting a dog to... Fallon. I mean, it's it's just common sense. And to put that into a sneaky amendment, I mean, it, people were just going crazy over it. And and I think that's why we, we as we saw like 3000 witness slips in opposition to that to that type of stuff. But it's it's just what they're doing is, is despicable. And uh, hopefully this this effort is it, you know, come the 23rd of February when this law is finally enforced. I'm hoping that they either comply uh, or, or they pack their bags and, and, and finally go somewhere else because I, I think we're all ready to just move on from this. This is just getting old at this point. So let's look at the timeline really quick. Um, you said it goes into effect at the end of February, essentially a month from the minute we are recording right now, this pet store will be into effect. So without too much speculation, we can basically guess that the pet industry wants their bill to at least go far enough that they can try and sue for a temporary restraining order, would be my guess, so they can continue selling puppies until this new bill does or does not pass, correct? Like, can you yeah, say that yeah, that's something similar? That's right, yeah. I mean, they, the way they worded this one was it's effective immediately. So let's say that, you know, and in fact, even by doing that, by by 
writing in, in the bill that they want this effective immediately, that actually triggers a three-fifth majority to pass. And so, you know, normally, like we did with our bill and, and just standard other run-of-the-mill bills, you know, if you put an effective date of like the next year, like January 1st of the following year, that would require a simple majority to pass. In Illinois, that's 60 votes in the House. But when you make something effective immediately, it, it triggers a three-fifth majority to pass. So they would need over 70 votes uh, in the House to get this one to pass. And also a supermajority in the Senate, which is 37 votes. 30 is, is your normal threshold. They would need 37 or 36. I, I, yeah, 36 votes. That's a lot to, to, to get on their side. Um, and then let's say the governor got the bill. We adjourn in the first week of April. And so let's say the governor got that bill in early May. I mean, and so it would be effective maybe in, in May. That's several months at least of, at this bill would, that our law would be into effect. And so, yeah, they probably would want to sue, get a, an emergency restraining order from a judge to block them from you know not being fined um, by the Department of Ag or something like that. Um, but yeah, as of today, Mindy, they've got, I think, 30 days exactly um, before this, this law kicks in. And we've seen no evidence that they're even considering transitioning to a humane model. And we've also seen no evidence that they're slowing down the shipments of puppies they're getting in every week. Yeah, uh, no evidence at all. I mean, all the main chains that we have in this state is they've been selling like they have before. They've, I've not seen any drop in numbers. Um, you know, we, we have reached out to a number of them and said, hey, are you aware of the law? And would you like to convert to a humane model? We have resources to help you do that. And they um, politely said to take a hike. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they just don't want to convert. And so come the 23rd of February, they'll be faced with some um, pretty stiff penalties per animal in the store um, if they want to stay open and risk enforcement. And I have a very good feeling that the Department of Agriculture is in a good place in Illinois to, to begin enforcing this law. I mean, they've, they've known about this for, you know, February of last year, they've known about the bill that we passed. We gave 180 days notice for them to kind of watch with the pet stores, um, put out rules to enforce the law. So they're, I believe they're fully prepared come the 23rd of February to enforce this uh, on, on day one. The question is, who stays open to risk enforcement? Who stays open to say, come after me? So they're clearly going to fight till the bitter end, till the last, very last end of this. <laughs> so. Um, so what do you need from advocates? Like what is, what is, like all of this happens really fast. They do things like striker bills and, and they're, you know, pulling out all the stops. Um, what is the best way to get people activated to, to do something when they need to do something to stop their efforts to, to repeal? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is to contact your state representative. Uh, immediately. Um, we go back in session tomorrow um, and we're there, you know, Monday through Friday mostly um, and contact your state representative and tell them to vote no on HB 4643. Um, make that call, send them an email. Um, even if you get a hold of their staffers, you know, ask that the state representative call you back and to vote no on this dangerous piece of legislation. That's the number one thing that folks can do to stop this bill from passing is a contact your rep and have them vote no on it. Um, but calling is so important too. I mean, just calling your legislator and leaving a message or talking to a staffer, that rarely happens. And so they really care. They care to hear from their constituents. Calling isn't as scary as it seems. I know a lot of millennials specifically are like, I hate picking up the phone. Um, it's really not that hard. And the staffer kind of walks you through the message that you're leaving, they make it pretty easy. Yeah, and a lot of the staffers that I talked to um, just last week, you know, they're very well aware of the law that we also passed last year. When we mentioned, you know, the humane pet store law, they go, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, we're, yeah, our rep, you know, voted in favor of that. And, and when we tell them that this law is gonna repeal it, 
like, oh no, how can that, how can that be? And, and why would they do that? And they go, yeah, we'll, we'll pass along that, that message to the representative. And, and um, I'm expecting a flurry of calls back next week from, from reps and, and, and staffers to say, you can count on the rep to vote no on, on this bill because we made so many calls last week um, to, to, get this, um, to get this bill opposed. So, but just calling your rep and making that known, it's the number one most important thing that someone can do. Well, I'm just glad that Mark brought up the enforcement aspect of it. Um, yep. That's the thing that I get the most frustrated with. The minute we announce some good news, like we just announced last week, that Houston passed a humane ordinance and it made six pet stores go humane or it will within a year, immediately all the comments are, well, no one's going to enforce it or who's going to enforce it or they're going to start using fake rescues. Like people who don't follow our page enough to know that we pay attention to stuff like that, it kind of really like weighs on my soul. So I get very annoyed when people are just like, well, it's not going to be enforced anyway. And we know in Illinois specifically that advocates aren't going to let that slide. Yeah, I mean, it's that that annoys me too, Mindy. I mean, just like any, I mean, literally any animal welfare law, there's there's a there's a small percentage of folks that that always have that. Well, it ain't going to be enforced, so what's the point? You know, and it's just like, well, then don't worry about it. I mean, it's I mean, what's the point of passing any law ever if that's if that's your attitude? But you know it. In Illinois, you know, we've we've talked with the director there quite a bit and, and staff, and you know, I, I feel pretty confident. I mean, and this is kind of easy, right? I mean, this is pretty easy to enforce. I mean, you, you guys know better than anyone. I mean, if we see records of stores buying from breeders, violation. That's you can't do that. Now, if they start using, you know, sham rescues, yeah, that that will be a little bit more of a challenge. But I don't see you know, all of these pet stores doing that. I Maybe one or two um, might say to come after me or, or they might use a sham rescue network. But even in that case, when we bring that evidence to the department, they're going to see it for what it's worth and, and, and issue violations for these stores. So I, I really think it's going to be pretty easy to enforce. And also because we know who the actors are. It's not like there's, there's 10,000 pet stores that have to comply it's like a dozen now at this point that we're keeping a real close eye on. So I feel pretty confident with it. And historically speaking, Petland has never had like an active role in the sham rescue puppy laundering scheme. And all of the records that we've collected, I think a few pet store or Petland stores in like Florida accidentally got a hobo canine fake rescue puppy, but it's because they also bought from Jack's regularly. So we know that a lot of those documents were doctored. I'm assuming the wrong name was put at the top of that CVI and Petland got a dog from Jack's puppies and they didn't care what business was on top. But historically speaking, we don't see Petland stores participating in the sham rescue puppy laundering scheme. Yeah, yeah, normally not. And I think we'll probably see a lot of these stores, you know, just pack their bags and, and go out east. And I think we're already beginning to see you know, the, the signs of that with, you know, so like the furry babies going to, is it Cherville mm -hmm. um, or, or is it Port, sorry, Portage, Portage, Portage. Indiana. Um, and Happiness as Pets is in Cherville. And I think there'll probably be some more cities, um, unfortunately, opening up in Indiana. But, you know, you speak of Indiana, I mean, they went from zero to seven ordinances, <laughs> you know, I, I think overnight. It's just right. remarkable to see. Right. And that's, you know, for everyone listening, we might be talking about Illinois right now, but this is like the case study for why we need to pass ordinances in your city right now, whether or not you have a current puppy selling store, what's happening in Illinois and has been over the last like nine months to a year is the stores are just hopping over the border and they're finding the next largest puppy market to start opening pet stores. We're seeing that in Indiana and then there have been threats of stores moving to Wisconsin as well. So that's why passing preemptive humane ordinances is so important. Yeah, so this is um, for our listeners. This is going to be a two-part episode. We're talking about the current um, fight on the state level that's happening now in Illinois. And next week, we're going to have Mark back on with us, and we'll be talking about what happens when a pet store is breaking a law. It is not a, an animal welfare law. It is a finance law. So we're going to be doing a deep dive into 
furry babies and their lawsuit against the state of Illinois so they can continue offering 200% interest on puppies in their stores. <laughs> Which right now we've seen, I, I guess we can touch on that in just a second, we've seen some stores still not, I mean, furry babies aside, there are still pet stores that are offering predatory financing. Yeah, yeah, there's a number of stores in Illinois still proudly advertising the financing of their puppies and their pet stores. And hey guys, that's illegal. If you're watching, that is illegal right now in Illinois, under Illinois law. So stop doing that. We see and, you. And the difference being it's a different enforcement agency. So this wouldn't be the Department of Ag stepping in and saying pet stores, you can no longer sell puppies. The enforcement is the finance committee the it's an alphabet soup one it's the illinois department of professional and financial regulation idfpr is enforcing that new finance law well so, that just goes to show you we're we're on it <laughs> not going anywhere these laws get passed we're going to continue to follow up <laughs> right and so we'll be here <laughs> um with the finance law again we're going to be talking about it the lawsuit next week but it's important for advocates all over the country to listen to because more states are pursuing this type of legislation. Illinois was the groundbreaking state to show case law, to show that pet stores should not be offering this predatory financing. And in 2022, we will be seeing several more states introduce this type of language. So that, that was episode 60 of Truth, Lies, and Puppy Mills. I hope you learned a lot about what's going on in Illinois and how that can apply to your state. Um, because, yeah, the, the battle there can be replicated elsewhere. Um, it's, it's an example of where you never give up and you, you see how relentless the pet stores are, but we keep going. And really, it, it all comes down to we're going to be here until every cage is empty. So... Thanks, everybody. Um, and then next week, we'll also have Mark on uh, to talk about another issue in Illinois. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Truth, Lies, and Puppy Mills, a Bailing Out Veggie production. We hope you were able to learn something in today's episode, and we also hope that you take that knowledge and use it to educate your friends and family as well. Please subscribe to this podcast on any of your favorite podcast apps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Bailing Out Benji. If you'd like to support our mission to end puppy mills, especially if we were able to teach you something new today, please consider making a donation on our website at www.bailingoutbenji.com. Bailing Out Benji is a small nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and providing the most current and accurate data regarding the puppy mill industry. We appreciate all of our listeners. Please stay safe, love your pets, and be kind to animals, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.